Thanks very much, Judith, for inviting me. Um, I have to say, yes, this is a very kind of strange format for having a, a, a science cafe, uh, but let's see if we can make it as uh, informal and intimate as, as possible under the circumstances. Um, the topic I want to talk about today is human nature, and this is an issue that's actually had kind of a revival in recent years. Um, as Judith mentioned, uh, I'm a professor of sociology, and within the social sciences, human nature was kind of a kind of no-go zone for a very long time, okay? Uh, basically, the idea was, well, uh, if you're talking about human nature, you're talking about, um, as we say in the trade, essentializing certain features about human beings that may perhaps be true about most males in the West or something like that, but really doesn't cover all of, all of humanity, strictly speaking. Uh, and then, in fact, if you want to really understand what human beings are about, uh, you're better off studying uh, the differences between them depending on the environmental conditions, the cultural conditions under which they are raised and in which oper they operate, rather than worrying about some sort of formal underlying property that might be found in their genes. Okay? This has, in fact, been a very long-standing kind of view uh, in the social sciences. In fact, it's one of the ways in which the social sciences uh, really distinguish themselves from the biological sciences in the 20th century. Uh, and to a large extent, I would say probably most social sciences more or less believe this. Okay? But over the course of my career, and, um, and what I'm talking about is my career being from the time I went to university, uh, which was 1976, uh, th that there has been basically a turn against this way of thinking. And so that nowadays it's quite fashionable uh, and in fact uh, even progressive to talk about human nature and that somehow we're getting to the, nat to the basis of it. Um, and, and you see this in many different ways and I'm especially struck by the way in which uh, this is a very popular kind of idea among younger people. Okay? See, when I was a student back in 1976, um, one of the big obstacles against human nature uh, was the idea that the sort of politics that was associated was seen as very regressive. And so typically uh, one would think about um, that if you think about human beings as somehow genetically programmed to be in certain ways, that certain things like, for example, aggression or war were inevitable. Okay, so there was a very famous book that was written, uh, that was translated into English in the mid-70s uh, by, Con uh, by Conrad Lorenz, one of the great ethologists, uh, won a Nobel Prize, um, so he studies animals and their natural habitats and sort of imprinting patterns and believed that this sort of thing was generalizable to also cover human beings and wrote a very famous book that was a bestseller in the New York Times called On Aggression, right? And, and this, was, this was a book that was published at the peak of the Cold War hostilities uh, where it didn't look like there was any kind of obvious solution, where we were in a period of mutually assured destruction. And somebody like Lorenz, and this was quite common view, would say, well, look, you know, there's just no way out of this because human nature, as with all animal nature, is a struggle for survival, it's instinctive, it's aggressive, and, you know, at, at the end, it's just death. Okay? And extinction, if you take the Darwinian story, is normal. Right? So in a sense, the fact that we will eventually blow ourselves up through some sort of nuclear holocaust is just a high-tech version of what normally happens according to evolutionary biology. Okay, and that was kind of the way the human nature line was being pushed in the mid-70s, okay? Um, and, uh, of course, if you were any kind of progressive, liberal, kind of uh, uh, intellectual, this was anathema, um, uh, especially because it seemed to offer no opportunity for change, right? No opportunity for things to improve. Um, and, and so this was very much, uh, you know, a, a problem. Uh, and on top of that, there were other issues as well, namely, if we really talked about human nature and we were really sort of rooting it in sort of genetic ancestry of people, then we'd also have to notice that people have been different genetically. Uh, and uh, somebody like Darwin, for example, talked about races as subspecies. That is to say, right, you have a kind of 
common hominid population, but certain groups reproduce themselves in very particular environments over long periods of time, and they produce the things we call races, and they are especially well adapted to the environments in which they normally inhabit, and the problems arise when you get people moving to environments where they're not well adapted. Hence, we have an immigration problem today, as you know, right? I mean, and very often this is talked about in those terms, and those terms are coming back into the argument, okay? In the mid-70s, that was seen as just anathema, right? That there's a sense in which this smacks of segregationism, it smacks of having a kind of, uh, kind of uh, almost like Nazi sorts of policies of having certain people in certain lands uh, and, and not being allowed to move from place to place. I mean, if you actually look at a lot of the scientific backing for a lot of the Nazi thinking uh, against Jews, the, idea, the problem with Jews at the end of the day was they didn't know where they belonged, right? They, they sort of migrated from their natural habitat and they moved into all these populations where they were maladapted and just caused disequilibrium to the ecologies. Okay, that was a biological explanation, and this was predicated on an idea of human nature that in a way also went down to kind of, as it were, subdivisions within human nature. Now, of course, the politics of all this is very invidious. It had very disastrous outcomes. And so, as a result, this whole line of thinking was basically just put aside for the at least three decades after the end of World War II. And so, if you look at something, for example, like the UNESCO uh, statement on race in 1950, Right, uh, you get this kind of classic liberal statement that race is just a cultural category, that when people want to make it into something biological, it is just a sort of prejudice, uh, and, uh, and that in fact there is no scientific basis for race. And this has been sort of the orthodoxy, and, and it lasted a very long time. It had in fact the agreement of both the, the natural and the social scientists. Um, when I studied uh, anthropology at Columbia University as an undergraduate, uh, I took courses by Marvin Harris. Okay? Marvin Harris was this cultural materialist who definitely was a believer in evolution, but was very clear that the evolution of, the human, of human beings broke radically from any kind of biological evolution. And if you're trying to come up with explanations of human beings, even for someone as materialistic and even Marxist as him, you would not refer to genetics. You would not refer to anything of that sort, but you would refer rather to environmental conditions that people have full control over in principle. And the, then the question arises, why don't they change things to make their lives better? And then you explain those things in terms of things that people have decided to do amongst themselves. Okay? Even somebody like Marvin Harris, who thought of himself as an evolutionist in the mid-1970s, a cultural materialist, nevertheless, would not have this kind of rock bottom fundamental notion of human nature which prescribed in advance that human beings could only be a certain kind of being under certain circumstances. Even someone like him, okay? I'm not talking about idealistic kind of people who of course believed that we could radically reconfigure ourselves, but even someone who called themselves a cultural materialist in the mid-1970s still held to this kind of radical view where human nature was just a myth, okay? This has all changed, okay? This has all changed. People are now much more open to the idea that there are some fundamental features about our genetic makeup, uh, you know, that in a way over millions of years of evolution, billions of years maybe, right, have sort of anchored us in certain ways. So there's only a certain range of ways in which we can be in the world no matter how hard we try, okay? And this has been the revival of human nature. Now, it's very interesting that this is seen as a revival of human nature because the very phrase human nature uh, is not actually a term that's ver that sits very comfortably in the Darwinian or evolutionary lexicon, okay? The idea of talking about there being certain kinds of natures to creatures, okay, is actually a kind of part of the language of creationism, okay, where you have natures, right? Different organisms have different natures. They've been created specially Right? And they've got certain properties and things like that. So, for example, if you look at someone like uh, Carolus Linnaeus, okay, this is the Swedish uh, bot botanist who is responsible for what, what is called in biology the binomial nomenclature, the fact that we name species by the two names, like Homo sapiens. Okay, this was Linnaeus's idea. It comes from the middle of the 18th century. Linnaeus is a special creationist. And so if you look at the names of the species, 
in their classical Latin form, and he, he named thousands of them, actually, and we still continue with those today, the ones that he knew about. Um, they're often named in terms of certain kinds of functional properties that they have, right? Certain things about them, about the way they behave in the world, okay? Uh, and that they are somehow intrinsic to these creatures. And that these creatures, as it were, were created to have these natures, okay? And our nature, right, as the wise ones, was to understand the rest of nature. And this is some kind of biblical entitlement because we're created in the image and likeness of God, and that's our nature, okay? It's, that's the kind of context in which the, context of human, the concept of human nature originally made sense, namely some kind of radical break between what is essentially human versus what is something else. Okay. But once we start with, uh, not only with Darwin, but even with Lamarck and, and, and with evolutionary thinking throughout the 19th century and the 20th century, right, what you end up getting is a kind of much more a uh, continuous notion of nature. And this is really exemplified by the way we think about, you know, the fact that most species, there's m enormous overlap in terms of genetic makeup. For animals, you know, 90, 95% genetic overlap. Where do you draw the line between one species and another species? Very difficult to do. Whether we're talking about in terms of isolating genes or we're talking about in terms of particular properties that are somehow this species has and no other species has, right? I mean, this is something that is very contested and very little of biology actually depends on these kinds of answers, okay? Because biology is quite happy to live with the idea of species as a purely conventional notion, right? For purposes of argument, we'll call this a species. Not because necessarily it has something that no other species has, but just because, because we're studying this thing and this is how we define our terms. That's the normal way in which this kind of stuff gets discussed today within biology, which means the whole idea of there being a human nature or an animal nature or any of those kinds of ideas really don't matter from a scientific standpoint, right? At least they haven't been decided yet from a scientific standpoint. But interestingly, the concept of human nature has come back into vogue and often with the backing of science, okay? Um, and, and, and I think that's something worth thinking about. Uh, and why is that happening? Because as I've just been arguing, right, the idea that the species should have distinctive natures at all doesn't seem to really fit with the way biology talks about things. Yet, we've gotten back to this human nature idea. Now, there are certain contexts in which this idea has been very powerful. And, and I've already alluded to one. And I think this is very much, uh, you can see this in a book like Steven Pinker's The Blank Slate. Some of you may have run across this book, right? Um, he is a developmental linguist uh, who's been a very big champion of what's called evolutionary psychology. And so this book, which came out in 2002, The Blank Slate, was a bestseller. Um, this book basically uh, is an argument showing that based on what we know about cognitive neuroscience and behavioral genetics and evolutionary psychology, that there are certain limits to what is possible for human beings to do. And for him, this is a very important point because this is, in a way, uh, giving a biological reason for why all the projects associated with Marxism and socialism and so forth failed. Okay, and so one of the, the big target for, for Pinker's book is what he calls utopian thinking. And utopian thinking is basically what he associates with the social sciences. And see, this is, where the, this is where someone like myself starts to get interested in the argument, because the revival of human nature is basically an argument against the distinctiveness and integrity of the social sciences, insofar as the social sciences presupposes that human beings are different. They're somehow beyond animals, right? That they, you know, um, and, and it's not because they've been programmed to be beyond animals, but it's just that they can kind of make themselves up as they go along. Okay, Karl Marx, God bless his soul, used to talk about human beings as homo faber, man the maker, right? So here we are basically constructing our worlds, reconstructing everything, and in a sense what Marx was trying to do was to give a kind of secular license to the sort of more progressive spin of certain kinds of stories uh, that come actually out of Christianity that human beings are put on earth 
to redesign the planet, right, so that they can then dominate it. Because that's what God wants. And Karl Marx was very on top of that kind of idea, right? And he believed that every human being was entitled to participate in the project equally because we're all, you know, part of the same kind of thing, these self-making creatures, okay? Um, what he didn't buy into, and this is the thing that's kind of come back with the idea of human nature, was the idea that, um, well, actually, if you really take Darwin seriously, uh, even if we're talking about human beings, there's going to be an enormous amount of variation amongst them, right? So human nature will not only be, as it were, the absolute limits beyond which we cannot go, but will also represent differences amongst ourselves that have been conditioned through our, you know, our reproducing in particular kinds of environments over generations and centuries and millennia and so forth. And so uh, while one might not want in our politically correct times to talk about races exactly or, or maybe even classes exactly, nevertheless, there are some clearly segregatable kinds of distinctions among human beings that make sense within their relevant context. And that's only to be expected given the nature of evolution. Right? Variation is normal, okay? And the problem is we don't value the variation. Instead, what we try to do, and this is Steven Pinker talking now, we try to minimize the variation. Some of you may know, uh, you know, Steven Pinker is a professor at Harvard University, and a few years ago, maybe three years ago now, um, the president of Harvard University, Larry Summers, the economist, um, made a comment that you know, maybe the reason why there aren't a lot of women professors of science at Harvard University is because you know, it's genetics, guys, right? I mean, it's not this, you know, beyond a certain point, there is no, it's not discrimination. There's beyond a certain point, you know, you can, only, you know, as it were, you can bring the horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So once you have removed all the barriers, all the social barriers, traditional social barriers of discrimination from women to advance in science, and they still don't become the top scientists. Well, rather than banging your head against the wall, why don't you recognize that there's actually some absolute genetic limit here? Right? This is basically what Summers was saying. I'm making it a little more, more explicit, but, but that's kind of what he was saying. Namely, that, that the fact that there still is this gender inequality in the sciences, you know, beyond a certain point of trying to do something about it, may just be a brute biological fact about human nature. Okay, this is kind of, and, and Steven Pinker says, well, you know, it just shows you what kind of a, you know, period we live in where re free speech is not respected, that a guy who says something like that, you know, straight up guy, gets fired from his job. Okay, that shows you how the world's changed. Okay, and, he, and, and Pinker's not alone, obviously, and the president of Harvard is not alone, and it's not a Harvard conspiracy either, right? I mean, um, you know, if in, 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 uh, in this country, uh, and this, this is something in a way that even alerted me to this happening uh, before Pinker, Pinker's book was published in 2002, um, there was a little pamphlet that the, uh, uh, the philosopher of animal liberation, Peter Singer, some of you may know about him, right? He's a, big, he's a big inspiration for a lot of the people who break into laboratories these days to liberate the animals from their cages, this kind of thing. Um, Peter Singer, wrote a little pamphlet uh, in a series that is published by uh, the London School of Economics, which has, a, even though London School of Economics has no biology department, nevertheless, they have a big Darwin project, publishing project going on, okay? Uh, and they have a whole series of books in this series. It's published uh, uh, by, um, let's see, what's his name? Weidenfeld and Nicholson, I believe. But the thing is, small book, maybe 75 pages long, and it's called, um, a Darwinian left, Peter Singer, 1999. And he basically gives you the philosophical foundation for the kinds of points that people like Steven Pinker and Larry Summers make in public, right? Namely the idea that the left needs, in a sense, to downscale its expectations about how the world can change uh, and uh, that they should replace Marx as the guru of the left with Darwin. Okay, because Darwin does believe, you know, Darwin will teach you, for example, to respect difference, to respect variation, to, of course, you can change things, you know, kind of mitigate things at the margins, but you can't fundamentally transform the way people are. You could do some things, but you can't do the kind of radical transformations 
that people like Karl Marx and other socialists who wanted a classless society were uh, on about, let alone those who have wanted a kind of gender-blind society to go on about. Okay. And moreover, I mean, the reason, one reason to read Singer's book, and I think perhaps this is going through Summer's mind as well, is that in the context of Darwinism, given the key role uh, that's provided by sexual reproduction, right, that uh, you take evolution seriously, really seriously in that Darwinian sense, right, there's actually evolutionary reason why you don't want to discourage women from doing what we would call the traditional women's roles from the standpoint of survival. Okay, and then Singer makes this point very explicit as one of the reasons why it may be there's this kind of genetic pullback that prevents women from really pushing themselves ahead. Okay, now these are people who, all of these people, right, Summers worked for Clinton, okay, Pinker, Singer, they're all people of the left, right? I mean, they're not, they're not, these are not conservatives. These, these are people from the left saying this stuff, okay? So in a sense, it gives you a sense of how the, how the world has changed in this matter. Now, I think a few things have happened to enable this to ha to, to, for this kind of ideological shift to occur. I mean, one of them is, of course, that um, you've got fewer and fewer people alive today who remember what happened the last time human nature was dictating our politics, right? So the people who remember you know, Nazism, who remember uh, segregationism, uh, you know, those kinds of institutionalized forms of racism, where racism wasn't just saying nasty things about people and occasionally beating them up, but was part of the law of the land. There are few and few people who can remember that. Okay, so there's a tendency to sort of underestimate the kind of implications that such a view could have. Um, and of course, a lot of the stuff has changed their names over time. So for example, when I was a student in the mid, late 1970s, um, one of the things that got introduced that really caused an enormous amount of problems was uh, sociobiology. This was a book by E.O. Wilson, expert on ants at Harvard, who wrote this general treatise basically talking about the biological foundations of social life across all species and doing a very interesting job uh, of showing how there's, in a sense, if you look at human, the way human beings behave socially, that the precedence, evolutionarily speaking, is not just to be found on, you know, from apes, right? They, they provide some precedent for the way we operate socially, but you can find precedence in all sorts of other species across the animal kingdom, because in a sense, we have got some of the genetic makeup of those creatures too. So not surprisingly, sometimes we're a bit like wolves, and sometimes we're a bit like insects, and sometimes we're a bit like apes, okay? But the point is, there is precedent in terms of the history of biology, uh, of the biological past, that is, that, that you can find in human beings. And Wilson basically thinks that the reason why, and he says this in the book, the reason why um, Darwin himself didn't push this view more, more explicitly, though he does push it to a certain extent in the book The Descent of Man, but, but Wilson really puts it on the table over 100 years later, um, was because of the theological business, right? The fear of religion, the fear of the backlash, and so forth. Now, Wilson at the time was reviled in 1970s. I mean, I studied him, um, but it was one of those things that people talked about in hushed tones. He was denounced uh, in uh, the New York Review of Books, uh, and, and uh, there were study groups that were arranged at Harvard University. Stephen Jay Gould was very instrumental in this. Um, that basically was a kind of stop sociobiology movement, effectively, and they had an enormous amount of press. And they actually had a lot of, uh, you know, they basically had turned the opinion against sociobiology, I would say, for about a decade, from like the late 70s to the late 80s. And you still see residue of this anti sociobiological sentiment, primarily among philosophers. Because during this period that I'm talking about, from the late 70s to the late 80s, you got a lot of philosophers of science who are now very prominent, who spend a lot of time hanging around Stephen Jay Gould and people like this. And so those guys tend to often be very much against sociobiology, still. The problem is you get a generational shift, and then the whole world looks different. As you may know, those of you who are younger may actually associate E.O. Wilson nowadays more with the idea of biodiversity. 
because that's his word too, not just sociobiology, but biodiversity. And his idea of trying to save the planet and you know, trying to make sure that all species have their kind of integrity and they respect them all and all the rest of it. And that the overweening pride of human beings, thinking that they are above and beyond animals, is in fact the cause of our major global environmental crises. This is E.O. Wilson today, environmental guru. Okay? His views have not changed. The world's changed. He's still the same guy. He was that way too. But now it looks a little bit different because all of the claims of human beings being radically different, not being reducible to some precedence in our his evolutionary past, right? Now that kind of view looks more plausible, at least as a survival strategy. Because when human beings think of themselves as radically rising above the animals, look at what they do. They try to transform the, per the planet. They introduce all these technological fixes. right? They, they artificialize everything. They kill off the rest of the planet. And look, and we have now all this climate change business. According to Wilson, and Wilson's on the same page as Al Gore, right? that we wouldn't have these problems if we just thought of ourselves as just another species with our own limitations, recognizing that other species also have a right to inhabit the planet too, and that we all, live to need, we all need to live harmoniously. That we, as human beings, don't have any specific, special entitlement to take over the place and to dispose of the creatures as we feel like it. Okay? So this is the thing. This is the, the you know, this kind of viewpoint looks different, that what at one point seemed like some radical reduction of the human to the animal, nowadays seems like a pretty viable survival strategy for keeping human beings in check so that they don't end up killing everything. And people like Wilson, who have been fortunate enough to live through this period, are now seeing themselves vindicated, typically at the hands of a younger generation of people who don't remember all the old stuff. Okay? And so sociobiology nowadays has been rebranded as evolutionary psychology. Okay? Uh, and evolutionary psychology is very trendy stuff. Okay? Uh, and in fact, even the science has gotten a bit better. All right? Um, and all of the, you know, back in the old days, we would say things like, well, you know, the problem with trying to study animal behavior or animal intelligence or animal consciousness is that we too quickly anthropomorphize these creatures uh, and we end up making them seem smarter or better than they really are. That was the old argument against this kind of stuff. But nowadays, right, we start to say something different, namely, maybe these animals are really quite smart and quite well adapted to their environments, but we just haven't figured out the way to tap into those specific capacities. And so, as it were, uh, it's not that we, you know, our anthropomorphism lies not in our generosity to making them more like us, but our stupidity in not being able to see the specific kinds of intelligence that they bring. And so that we need actually much more sophisticated means of research to be able to figure out exactly the kinds of intelligence that animals bring. Okay? Now this way of shifting the burden of proof, where we start to think that, well, maybe it's not the animal's fault they're not performing well in our test, but maybe we're just not giving them the right tests, right? that way of shifting the burden has been, in fact, very influential in fueling a lot of the animal rights stuff. Because the animal rights stuff, if you look at people like S Peter Singer and so forth, the reason why we should be taking animals seriously is because they feel pain, they have a lot of the mental properties, consciousness, sentience, intelligence, maybe even rationality, that we typically take to be relevant to humans in order to give them the relevant kinds of moral properties, and that in the past we have just not been tapping into them sufficiently. This is very much part of the animal rights argument, this kind of equalizing of the ledger. Okay? And that our failure to appreciate that is in fact a sort of species-bound prejudice on our part. Again, going back to the limitations of human nature in recognizing the otherness and the entitlement of other species. Okay. Um, how much more time would you say I have? Five minutes, okay. So what the overall picture here is, 
you know, supposing you're a social scientist. I find very, very often when I, tr when I travel around and I'm talking to young people who are very much animated about questions about what is the nature of society, what is the nature of the human being, and so forth, uh, and they really want to get at these questions in a sort of deep way, it is very common these days for young people to think about these matters in biological terms. Okay, in other words, uh, if they want to understand the nature of what makes us so different uh, as human beings, so distinctive as human beings, they don't, they don't necessarily think of looking at the history of humanity or the social history of humanity or whatever as the way to go about figuring this out. No, they think that the best way to do this is actually by doing a variety of uh, a research across a variety of species and then doing comparisons to see where humans, to what extent humans differ from other animals. Okay? And if you look at a lot of the research going on in evolutionary psychology today, and a lot of it is not just done by biologists, right? You have people who are primarily trained as psychologists doing it, people primarily trained as anthropologists doing it, right? So in other words, people whose PhDs may be in the traditional social science subjects, but whose research agendas have migrated in a more biologically open direction, okay? The kinds of questions that they're trying to frame are in fact the questions that you might say were the ones that were fundamentally posed by you know, political philosophy, moral philosophy in the past. And in a way, posed much more explicitly okay, um, than what you find actually today in the social sciences. And this then raises a kind of a, an, in, an interesting issue, um, and, and I'll just close on this. Uh, namely, to what extent can we continue to justify a distinction between the, the natural and the social sciences in this kind of climate, and why would one want to do this? According to E.O. Wilson, in one of his later books called Consilience, which is an old 19th century term, which means drawing together different sources of facts into a kind of unified picture of knowledge, this word consilience, um, he believes that the reason why the social sciences continue to survive, even in the 21st century, uh, is basically for the reason that theology survived. Namely, that social scientists seem to be harboring this kind of idea that human beings have a kind of distinctive, not nature exactly, but something like a soul or consciousness or meaningfulness or something like this that somehow pulls human beings away from the rest of the animal kingdom. And according to Wilson, as long as people continue to think that way, you're never going to get, you're never going to get a science of the human or a science of the social. The only way you're going to get that is by absorbing the phenomena of human life into the natural world. And so in other words, the idea being that when we talk about human nature, the emphasis ought to be put on the nature, right? That we are just part of nature, that we are, as it were, some cutoff point in nature, that there isn't a qualitative difference between us and the rest of the natural world, but rather it is a gradual difference, a continual difference one that in a way is arbitrarily set off against nature for various kinds of historical reasons, but not necessarily reasons that have necessarily made our own lives or the rest of the planet's lives any better. Okay? I don't agree with this view. I think this view is very wrong-headed and will actually end up, I think, licensing a lot of things that we would find morally abhorrent. Okay? And I'm not talking about gas chambers and stuff like that. We don't have to go down that route. Okay? But nevertheless, I do think that, if we, that the, one of the consequences of this kind of view of absorbing the human back into nature, it may in fact do wonders for solving our environmental problems, but I also think one of the things it does is it makes it difficult to defend things like the dignity of the individual human existence. Okay? It makes it a lot easier to justify people coming in and out of existence. Okay? I mean, these are bigger kinds of issues. Um, and, and maybe we can get into this in the discussion. But the point is that there is something to fight for here. At least one has to think about this. Because what we're seeing now is basically a gradual absorption of the human back into the natural. Okay? Uh, and being done not as it was in the past by people who we would think about as being conservative or reactionary, but as being done on the side of the liberal left. Okay? And the question is, is there something worth fighting for in the name of the human that is still separate from the natural. And I'll, st I'll stop here.
you know, 20 years ago, they would put them in some sort of rehab, right? I mean, they, they, that, that, well, that's the point, right? No, no, I'm, no, I'm just saying that, that, that the issue here is the extent to which somebody like that who goes into a mall and shoots people is, you know, whether that person is recoverable, okay? Uh, and, and the whole argument about human nature is about that issue in a way, right? Because if you believe that there are f fixed limits and there's a sense in which, sorry, this guy was born with the wrong gene or the wrong gene was switched on or so forth, you know, he basically did kind of what he did uh, and, and I don't care how many rehab clinics you put him through, he's going to do it again, right? I think we're moving back more to that sort of mentality. Whereas, let's say, you know, when I was a student, the idea was everybody's recoverable, everybody's redeemable, right? I mean, I, you, know, you may have seen the movie Clockwork Orange, which is kind of a satire of this, right? Where, where, you know, oh, yes, this guy does all these atrocious things, but then we're just going to put him in the hospital and fix him up, and then he goes out, he does it again, and we'll put him in the hospital and fix it up. Well, that's what, you know, that movie came out in the 70s, and that's what people thought back then, and this was a satire on that. Nowadays, people say, no, sorry, this guy's just a bad egg. End of story. And we could tell you now why, because Gene X was r working wrong. See, that's the difference, I think, in the worldview that we're talking about here. Yeah, no, 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 no. I agree. I agree. These things do go through cycles. What I think is interesting about the times in which we live is the extent to which people on the left are endorsing the idea of a fixed human nature. That's the thing that's interesting, right? The Larry Summers, the Steven Pinkers, the Peter Singers, those are the people who are telling us a lot about human nature now and telling us that it's relatively fixed. Whereas traditionally, the people who would be making that line, and they've made it many, many times, were right, people on the right, right? Conservatives, right? I mean, that's the thing I think that's kind of interesting from a political standpoint about this. Do you think that? How? No, no I mean, uh, you know, it's an interesting argument. I mean, wh 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 why would you believe that? Well, uh, you know, this is the big topic he's raised here, uh, and I've been very much involved in this. I mean, some of you may know I was, uh, I testified on behalf of the intelligent design people in the United States in the, in the uh, trial uh, in Pennsylvania three years ago, and one of the books that's been advertised is, has something to do with that. Um, and I think that there, you, you are raising an interesting point because, see, I think people who are very pro-science often don't realize just how um, deeply infused the religious motivation has been historically, okay? Because if you were to, I mean, if you, if you ask an evolutionist to explain how do we develop knowledge, right? Knowledge has to do with our ability to adapt to the environments in which we live. And so somebody like Richard Dawkins would tell you something about an extended phenotype where, we, where organisms reconstruct their environments to make it easier for them to survive and reproduce. But science is much more than that, right? Because science aims to have a kind of comprehensive understanding of all the world, all of the universe, including the parts that we're never going to inhabit. Right? I mean, that's the point, right? That's what makes science a kind of very distinctive form of knowledge, a whole Newtonian ambition, right, that we're going to understand everything in a unified way, even if we never see it, right? Even if we never encounter it, right? This is, this is a very distinctive kind of knowledge. It's not like the knowledge you need to get around, the, you know, an everyday life. And this is something I think the Darwinian evolution has a very hard time to explain why people would do something like that. Because it's not at all obvious. 
that having aspirations for a kind of unified understanding of reality that you would never have any contact with because you're talking about things that are light years away or you know, beginning of time and all that stuff that science is concerned about very often, right? what would be the evolutionary advantage of that? In fact, it, arguably, there'd be no advantage. right? So that very often, the kinds of extreme sort of scientific thinking that we've had has actually also led us to create nuclear bombs and, you know, and all kinds of weapons of destruction and stuff like that. Yet that's part of science too, right? And, and what, I'm pointing, what, I'm, what I'm saying to you here, here is that the impetus for doing science in this big, grand, unifying kind of way definitely has to do with human beings thinking of themselves as not just another creature trying to adapt to its environment but actually trying to kind of gain a grasp of everything. No other creature has that kind of ambition, at least, and survives, okay? But we do, and that is historically a religious impulse, right? That whole idea, the Newton impulse to have a unified theory of everything, that has a lot to do historically with his religious convictions and about what human beings are designed to do, right? And, you know, see, this is where people like Wilson turn out to be quite interesting, because Wilson's saying, you know, if we're going to save the planet, we have to downscale our expectations. Well, maybe we didn't, if you're going to take that argument seriously, we might need to downscale our expectations about science, right? Not just about, you know, what we think about human beings, but what we think about science itself. But it seems to me, as long as physicists are still trying to understand the fundamental forces of nature and the beginning and the end of the universe and all those big cosmological questions, they're still playing the theologian's game, only with mathematics. Right? That problem has not gone away. And that is the signature thing about science. That's the thing that distinguishes science from technology, distinguishes it from just mere animal survival. And so what I, what I agree with in your point is that that's a religious motivation that keeps that project going. Because it's not at all obvious that our survival as ordinary animals on Earth benefit from it. Okay. I agree. Yeah, yeah, but see, I agree with all this, right? But notice that this argument has purchase only if you have a lot of faith in human ingenuity. Well, human ingenuity came about because we have a large brain. At some point, we got a large brain. Physically, we got bigger brains than any other animal. That's just as simple as that. We have more brain matter. Our brains are more complex. We wouldn't be doing that. Well, I mean... (laughs) Word like complexity is a very loaded term in this context. I, I think... Well, <laughs> sure. And so, and, and all organisms use all of their uh, material capacities to maximum efficiency. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that. Well, that sounds like the argument. No, we didn't. This is the problem, right? It's not obvious we have. That's the point. We, in some senses, it's easier, but in other senses, it's more difficult, right? We've done both. That's the interesting point. We haven't become more adaptive to our environments with our larger brains, right? We've become adaptive in certain respects, but in other respects, we've actually endangered ourselves and everybody else more than any, any other creature has ever done before. We've done both at once. Now, you tell me what that shows. Short sighted. No, but the point is, you believe we're going to get out of this hole, don't you? Of course. Well, that point, that belief of yours, that's the belief of yours I want to focus on. That's the religious residue. Yes, it is. It's a religious residue of science. It's not at all obvious why one should believe this. Well, I don't know. Maybe it all depends on the I'm not saying it won't, but I'm saying something will have to drive from the zone of the atmosphere. Hey, look, you know. Yeah, look, well, then why, why is it you got people like E.O. Wilson and others who are evolutionists who are actually saying, hey, we've got to stop. We've got to pull back. We've got to kind of, you know, take. What? <laughs> well, okay, I'll leave that there. <laughs> I don't know.
<laughs> no, but, but, the, but the, the point is, look, I actually share your optimism, okay? But I also believe that that kind of optimism is a secular residue of the original religious belief in how science will enable us to reconstruct the world in our image. That, you know, Condorcet, Marquis de Condorcet, the Enlightenment philosopher who coined this phrase, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, okay? This is what we're talking about here. Why would anyone believe such a thing, right? I mean, point, but the point is, you know, I believe it too. But it's not at all obvious whether that's a, a, a kind of indefinite imperative that's going to work all the time. We might well extinguish ourselves. But I agree. But why not? Why not? Why not downsize? Why not down? You know, why not live a kind of more modest existence? Well, actually, well, it depends what you mean. Evolution doesn't work like that. Come on. It's not that. Oh, well, well, you may, you may, oh, I see what you're saying. Well, you may have a point there, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, our, that in a sense, our ability to change our minds on these fundamental issues. Yeah, it's interesting. You, have, you hold a very interesting collection of views, it seems to me, in terms of <laughs> They're coming from many different sources. Uh, but I, uh, uh, okay, okay. Well, why don't we just leave that point there? Okay. <laughs> no, the size of the forebrain. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Jealousy and avarice and sure. Mm -hmm. And it all harks back to the fall from grace. Yeah, yeah. Um, but my more serious question is how does the human genome project map onto this change of worldviews, change of this ideological shift? Do you think that the human genome project is, as it were, the fruit of this refocusing on human nature and the essentials of human nature, or do you think it's actually feeding that or a bit of both? I think actually it's motivated by something a bit more independent. Uh, I mean, the problem is with the Human Genome Project, from the standpoint of whether you can specify what human nature is, it still leaves an open verdict, okay? Uh, because it's not at all clear what it is, even if we can sequence these things, the, the, the genome, what it is that actually distinguishes us from other creatures in a way that is significant at the level of behavior or anything. We still haven't figured that out yet. And it's not at all obvious that's going to provide us much, much help. Um, I think, though, that the Human Genome Project was very symbolically important because it still keeps this idea alive that all of us, regardless of our biological rootedness, are somehow rooted together. Right, that there's some sense in which there's a common human genome at some level. At least that's the kind of the, the rhetoric of this. Um, and in a way, that's probably the most palatable feature of the human nature rhetoric, generally speaking. The fact is, if there is a human nature, we've all got it. That's the only part of the human nature rhetoric I, in fact, like, is the kind of egalitarian character of it, you might say. Right? Because very quickly, it, you, know, you move on to saying that there are different types of human natures depending on the environments in which people live and you get these sort of subspecies notions that very quickly move to race. So we have this human genetic diversity project which has been running right alongside the human genome project which has tried to track the differences in the genomes and how these might be the results of migration patterns through the earth and so forth. Okay? And that it seems to me very quickly moves back into an old kind of racist country where, where human nature gets discussed as well. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier in the talk. Um, but, and also, uh, the, the, I guess the thing that I think is mildly positive about human, the Human Genome Project is the fact when somebody like, let's say, Craig Venter talks a lot about it, he's thinking about it as a kind of opportunity for coming up with, with ways of understanding how diseases work and stuff like that. We, we might come up with new cures and things like that to keep human beings alive longer. And I think in a way that's one of the more beneficial aspects of thinking about human beings in those terms is that, in fact, it might actually en enhance the human condition in some way. 
And I think for someone like him, that's probably his main motivation. I don't think someone like him worries about the human nature question at the philosophical level at which we're talking about it now. So I mean, that's, so I, I mean, I, so I give it a kind of mixed verdict. I don't know what curiosity, you know, I know you have evolu- I know I'm calling you an evolutionist, but evolutionists always talk about curiosity. God, curiosity is just, is just a kind of empty term for whatever attracts you. Why worry? Why worry about this problem? It's a very bizarre thing to worry about. I mean, from a practical standpoint, from any of the things that evolution is normally concerned about as being responsible for how creatures adapt, understanding the origin of the universe is light years away from what, what any creature needs to adapt in the world. Given the lifespan of creatures, g- given the fact that creatures reproduce, right, they replace each other in relatively short periods of time, why be concerned about the origin of the universe? Curios- See, curiosity is too broad an explanation. Curiosity also explains why we're interested in gossip, right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily specify the nature of the curiosity, which is, as you say, we are very interested in the origin of the universe. We somehow think that has some kind of meaning. It provides some kind of answer to something. Why are we worried about this in the first place? You see, I mean, I think this is the thing that evolutionary arguments just don't really get at at all. I mean, curiosity is just a, an empty term. It's funny to know, you know how things are. Things, yeah, things. The f- origin of the universe is not things. Why? No, no, come on, sorry. Why? I mean, you, so you take this stuff for granted. I'm saying, think like an evolutionist. See, what you're doing is you're bringing the old style way of thinking right, where we think of ourselves as rational beings, and as rational beings, we're always being propelled to ask why, 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 why. Yes, Descartes and Kant and all the rest of them, they were propelled to ask why, why, why. But if you're an evolutionist and for whom knowledge is what enables you to adapt in the environments in which you live, it doesn't follow you're going to take a rationalist tra- uh, track like that. Okay? I mean, this is the thing, you cannot just superimpose the traditional Western philosophical way of thinking about stuff on the evolutionary viewpoint. They are really radically different when it gets right down to it. Okay? I mean, people like Descartes thought, you know, that these questions of asking why, why, why were important because he thought of himself as a rational being and rationality was a special power bequeathed to him by God and he was entitled to do this. What's the story that the evolutionist gives to entitle that question to have the significance it does in our culture? I don't see a clear answer to that. I mean, okay, so I, I mean, I just, you should not take for granted that evolution will legitimate everything we already take to be good questions. How would you falsify that view? How would you falsify that view? How would you show your view is wrong? I mean, if you, I mean, uh, this is the thing. I, uh, how would you decide? Look, I, I guess I know evolutionists talk this way, but I want to see something a little more on the table here because uh, I think you cannot. Pre- I, I guess, given the way in which evolutionary theory is constructed, you cannot presume that it would legitimate all of the things that we have in fact considered to be good science or good ways of thinking. It seems to me that you'd want to give it a kind of adaptive test. And to say that things are, I mean, 
The interesting thing about evolutionary theory, if you take this view seriously, is that most of the things that we consider to be most distinctive about human beings turns out to be byproducts that are maintained by accident. That's very bizarre. Okay, maybe it's not bizarre if, you're, if you believe in radical contingency in the world, in which case you don't need science for that. Mysticism will work just as well. I, had, I, I haven't consulted with either. Uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, but I think, but I think, look, if, we, if we're going to take a scientific story seriously about how human beings have developed in the world, we have to figure out why human beings even bothered doing science in the first place. Uh, I think it's quite clear, historically, that had human beings believed Darwin's theory back in 4th century BC, they'd never bothered doing science. Okay, because they wouldn't have believed that it was a, a divine order. They wouldn't have believed there was a unity to understand. They wouldn't have believed any of those kind of fundamental principles that have, in fact, motivated science over the last 2,500 years. Right? What they would have learned, and, and this is, in fact, the view of the Atomists and the Epicureans and all these people in the ancient world who held a metaphysics very similar to that of Darwin. Okay, got a chance-based universe where things just hang around for a certain amount of time and then they disaggregate and turn into something else. That view is around in the ancient times. The people who held that view, who were often called materialists, they never did science because they didn't think things hung around long enough to be worth studying. Okay? The people who did science were the people who believed there's some kind of order out there that we can figure out somehow, that the universe is intelligible. Okay? So my point would be that, you know, regardless of whether God exists, and I have, you know, I can't give you the answer to that question, that a belief in the existence of at least some kind of divine order has been necessary to get science to where we are now. Okay, uh, and, and this is obviously unraveled, and, and it was realized in Darwin's own day, so that Thomas Henry Huxley, toward the end of his life, gave a very famous lecture, Evolution and Ethics, where he said, look, you know, this Darwin worldview is true, and it's going to be important, increasingly important in the coming century, and he was referring to the 20th century, and the question for us is going to be, how do you continue to motivate science once you stop believing that there is this grand unified scheme that somebody like Newton believed in because he thought he was sort of thinking God's thoughts? How do you continue to motivate that project once you no longer believe that? That, Huxley believed, was going to be the problem for the 20th century uh, as people, more and more people came to believe that Darwin was correct. Okay, and that's where he left the, the issue. And I think that issue is still with us today. Okay, I think that's the issue. And what I'm saying in this talk with regard to a lot of the people who want to bring back the idea of human nature is part of their rhetoric is to downsize our intellectual ambitions and to downsize our intellectual expectations because they just lead to error and destruction and so forth. And I think what that means in the long term is we downsize our science. Okay, uh, it's science self-limiting. Well, the religion is just eliminated in this view, right? The elim religion's eliminated and the science is downsized. Okay, guys, I think we'll leave it there. I want to take a little break, get some food, um, and sort of recharge. <laughs> we'll take out there as well. And um, we have the whole rack set out here. Now we've closed there. And so it's going to be in the Flux Cafe where we'll have the finger food there and we can get questions going again. All right? Thank you. Thank you.